On this episode of Passive Real Estate Investing with Mavericks, I sit down with Leslie Ann Morris to uncover Smoky Mountain short-term rentals. Hey, Mavericks. This is Ava Baukamp, and this episode of Passive Real Estate Investing with Mavericks is brought to you by Legacy Impact Investors. We are an industrial investment firm located in cash flow country, the Midwest. We strive to shield off risk and beat inflation, all while producing predictable cash flow. We curate real estate investment opportunities for busy professionals and other real estate investors seeking passive income. To learn more about what we do and connect with me, go to www.legacyimpactinvestors.com. Maverick, noun, unusual person, a visionary, leader, go-getter, an independent thinker. They see the vision for their life and pull that future towards them with an unyielding belief that things can and must be better. They achieve what most won't. Innovative, influential, daring, and direct with a remarkably high tolerance for taking calculated risk. A foe to the status quo. This is Passive Real Estate Investing with Mavericks. Your host, Neil Timmons, has been involved with over $300 million in real estate transactions. He's a published author, commercial property investor, and real estate syndicator. This show is for those who want to learn how to earn passive income through real estate investing. Now, here's your host, Neil Timmons. Welcome to Passive Real Estate Investing with Mavericks, where we provide actionable steps for you to grow your passive income and become job optional. During this episode, you're going to get to discover a couple tricks and secrets and details about Smoky Mountain short-term rentals. For those of you who are new, I'm your host, Neil Timmons. I love passive income from real estate. Now, before I introduce you to today's Maverick, I want to make a request that at any point, you like what you're hearing, give us a thumbs up and be certain to subscribe to the show. Never miss a valuable episode. And if you love what you're hearing, give us a written review. Plus, be sure to look at the description of today's episode. We packed it with thousands of dollars in free resources. Now, today, we've got the privilege to learn from a person who's been investing in the Smoky Mountains since before it was even cool, since pre-pandemic. Prior to her career in real estate, she was a banker. In fact, she was a banker for SpaceX. It all changed when she eventually got turned on to real estate and then narrowed her focus from the whole country into one little spot, the Smoky Mountains. I would describe today's Maverick as someone who's absolutely passionate about cabins. Today's Maverick, Leslie Ann Morris. Leslie, how are you? I'm doing great. How are you, Neil? I'm super, thanks. I'm excited you're here. This will be a fun conversation because I already know what's coming and the audience is getting into it because it's going to be cool. Tell me this, for the audience's sake, who are you? Where are you from? What do you do? I'm Leslie Ann Morris. I hail from the sticks of Northern California. <laughs> Honestly, like very rural California, north of San Francisco, up by Eureka is where I'm from. There's a lot of cabins there to give you a hint of what we're going to talk about. <laughs> but I am in the cabin world, came in a roundabout way. I started as a career banker. I actually went to school, got a finance degree and was an intentional banker. I had clients at the top of my career. I was the banker for SpaceX when I lived in Southern California. And probably right about that time, I kind of started to not feel so fulfilled in the corporate world. And I said, what's out there? What can I be doing? And I remembered these conversations that I'd had with my clients when I was in my early 20s about building real estate portfolios because they were all developers and real estate investors, what have you. And I had one of them who would kind of mentor me a little bit and tell me things like, you know, just keep plugging away at your career and learning those skills. I did credit underwriting. Largely, I was a lender for a long time. He's like, one day you'll be ready to go and you'll be so glad that you got involved. And that day came in 2019. I kind of hit like not the bottom, but I kind of thought, how do I climb the ladder quicker, faster and make more money? What do I need to be doing? And maybe I need to be doing some of my own stuff in the background. So mm -hmm. I had started a master's degree to get that MBA title. I thought that would help me climb the corporate ladder. And then I also started buying cabins in the Smoky Mountains, which is in eastern Tennessee. But quickly, the cabin world turned into this very lucrative thing that I was able to scale really fast. 
I bought several cabins over the span of three years and I was able to quit my job, which was a very well-paying high job in the bank. I was a senior vice president, but I was able to quit and then go full-time as a real estate investor. I like to joke that I have a lifelong game of Monopoly that I'm playing. <laughs> yeah, That's kind of how it feels. But then I didn't want to just live off of my portfolio income. I wanted to do other things for my cost of living so that that could just be like the retirement strategy. Um, so I created two companies that grew out of a pain point that I had with my portfolio. And those two companies are Josh's Cabins, which is a full service property management company. I was self-managing the cabins and it was like an awful lot of work. So that's where that company came in to help me. And then I created Invest in the Smoky Mountains, which is a real estate team that is focused on helping basically passive investors that want to get into short-term rental, but they don't want to self-manage it like I did in the beginning. They want help on every aspect. We tell them what to buy, how to underwrite it. We do free classes. We do a lot of coaching, mentoring, education, and we specifically are working to get them cabins that make money in the Smoky Mountains. That's it. That's everything. <laughs> good, good, good. That's a wonderful background. And you've you set us up quite well for as granular as we're about to get. Tell me why the Smoky Mountains? Yeah, it's interesting. I knew nothing about Tennessee other than the fact that there was like Justin Timberlake was from here. Okay. That was all I knew. I knew nothing. I have no family here. I originally, when I was going to start investing in real estate, I was looking at long-term rentals, just buying a single family home. I was actually looking in Ohio where the price per square foot was low and there was a lot of demand for rentals. And I entered a contract to buy one and overnight the seller decided not to sell and it kind of scared me. It made me wonder if my tenant would wake up in the middle of the night and vacate the home, decide not to pay the rent. Yeah. So that gave me a little bit of fear. And so I went back to the drawing board. I started doing more research. And that was when I discovered the world of vacation homes. I just thought it sounded really cool to own a cabin because I love cabins. I've been to 45 countries. I've been all over the world. I've stayed mostly in cabins. Finland, Iceland, Alaska, you name it. I've stayed in cabins. Yeah. And so I just thought, well... I'm going to give this a go. The price per square foot at the time in the Smokies was very, very low, a lot lower than Southern California, short-term rental vacation markets there. Yeah. So I just bought the first one and said, you know, I'll just put it on Airbnb. I'll put it on that platform. And if it can break even, but I have a cool place to stay, that's how I'll get my start in real estate and I'll cross my fingers for appreciation. But it cash flowed like that. It was making money hands over fists. And so then I just bought more and more and more and more. <laughs> yeah, you just went in from there. And so now you get to a point where you've got a team, you advise people who want exposure or they want to be involved and they can do it, but they don't have to be kind of all in like you have options for them from a property management standpoint. So they don't have to be all hands on. They get to choose at some point, essentially, whether they want to be yeah. hands on or they just want your guidance and then be hands on. I know this because I've had enough conversations, but what are the biggest challenges, the biggest pitfalls relative to managing one's own property? Uh, well, I mean, a lot of the investors I work with, they're out of state. So the biggest pitfall is they're really far away. Hmm. It makes it to where you can't put your hands on it. You've got to kind of trust vendors that are going in and out of the place. Like the cleaner is the biggest vendor that right. we utilize. So the cleaner is responsible for going in between guests and cleaning and making sure that it's rent ready for the next guest. And if you fail in that process, if you don't get five-star reviews, you won't get booked. I mean, it's a whole online shopping experience where people are looking at reviews. So it's very different from traditional real estate investing. That's why I created these companies for people to be passive. So they don't need to think about the hospitality side of it. They can literally just look at the bottom line mm -hmm. and let us focus on what we're good at, which is hospitality. But that's the biggest thing. I mean, we make it really easy to where they don't have to deal with the headaches, but there will be some circle backs. We try to minimize those. For example, if something comes up and they have an issue and it's over a certain threshold dollar amount, whatever we set with that owner, we are going to come back and say, hey, this is the issue that's come up. How do you want us to handle this? If it's a safety issue, we're jumping on it right away. If there's guests in there, we're jumping on it yesterday. We're not letting right. a decision be delayed based on, you know, 
health stuff, like if a staircase gets damaged and people can't access the property, we obviously can't rent it. So we're thinking of all those things. We're putting safety and hospitality first, but we are thinking about investor bottom line. So we do bid out for different jobs and try to get competitive prices for the work that we're needing to do on their behalf. When I think about the investor's bottom line, there's a number of things that go into that. You touched on it, obviously property management being a a large one. Mm -hmm. There's two other factors in my mind that play a role in that bottom line. One of them is lending, which I'm going to come to second. The first one is the asset itself, meaning the size of the asset, the location, the proximity, what it is that you're physically buying. So talk to me about when you're buying a cabin in the the Smokies, there's probably a spot that's too big. There's probably a spot that's too small. There's probably a sweet spot. So talk to me a little about that. Well, there's a market for a lot of different things, shockingly. The Smoky Mountain market is within driving distance. Like most of the United States population, like 60 to 70% of all people that live here, they can get there within an eight hour drive or less. Mm. So we're getting a ton of people. The park, the numbers each year are mind blowing. It triples or quadruples the numbers of the next popular park, which is the Grand Canyon. So we got like 12, 13, 14 million visitors at the high during COVID. I think last year we were at 13. This year I'm expecting 12. We're going to be back at 12 million. But yeah, all that to say we're getting big groups. We're getting couples. We're getting families. Like the demographic we cater to is a woman ages 35 to 50 years old booking a trip for a family. That's our primary thing. So if you can get a cabin that's like a two bed, two bath, it's probably going to do great. It does need to have some very key amenities. I have all this on YouTube. If anybody wants to go listen, I have hours of stuff on there about the market and what we recommend investing in. But in a nutshell, it's got to be special. It's got to have like mountain view, some sort of mountain view or something different that sets it apart. It can't just be a cabin in the forest. That's too common. People will just pass it up. So Mm. either the decor inside has to be special or something. And then it has to have a hot tub and potentially some sort of game like a pool table or foosball or something where people can say, oh, you know, we're going to spend the evenings in the cabin. We've got the hot tub. And then we also have this other thing to do. Like they're all checking these amenity boxes. when yep. they. So if your property doesn't have those amenities, you won't even show up in the search. I will say back to the conversation about size of property, I do manage much, much larger cabins. Like my sweet spot for me as an investor is two bed, two bath, three bed, three bath. Mm. But we manage one that's massive and it's like a five bed, five bath and it does phenomenal. It's booked all the time. So it's just a different type of group. The difference too with the cabins is you have to have a really strong pricing strategy for something that's like a five bed, five bath, because people aren't going to last minute book that. Like if you are getting Correct. close to the dates and yep. it's not booked yet, yep. that's a huge group. Like you're not yeah. going to be able to just drop the rate a little bit and get it booked for the next day where you could do that with those smaller cabins. The small so ones, a yeah. A two, two or a three, two, you're into a family, a five, five yeah. or a five, four, you're into families. Yes, definitely. Yeah. Or sometimes people want more space and they'll book the bigger property because they have stellar views, but that's usually pretty rare. Yeah. All right. So move on to lending. Mm -hmm. How do people, when you're buying this, is how is the lending different than just buying a long-term rental house? Talk to me about what that looks like. Yeah. Well, lenders have come around to short-term rentals. The majority of them are lending to short-term rentals. The big risk for a lender, since I was one for 23 years, is no leases. There's no lease. So there's no like guaranteed repayment source. Mm -hmm. You can do conventional lending. You can do the debt service coverage ratio lending, which is like an asset based loan. And then you can do also commercial loans. There's the full gamut for these things. They are single family, but they're largely ran like hotels. So they kind of fit in this weird category of commercial, but it just depends who you talk to and how they're lending. But my preferred lenders, they will lend based on like AirDNA, which is a tool. It's a website. You can go out and look and see, project what you think the thing's going to make. And then you can work with property managers also like me that can help project what the cabin's going to make. But the lenders will use sometimes a rental projection from a company or they'll look at AirDNA themselves and maybe give the data a haircut based on we're coming out of COVID, which was a really high period of travel demand. And now we're seeing some softened demand for travel. 
We had May was very slow. We just got through the April and May season. Mm -hmm. They were actually families going to graduations again and helping kids finish their school year. And But now June and July is an explosion of activity. We're yeah. getting last minute bookings left and right. My phone makes a sound every time. And I'm like, I have to learn, I have to shut this sound off. I mean, it's exciting, but it's just, it's too much with how many properties we have. Are you a passive real estate investor seeking financial freedom? Well, today's market's unique and it's ever changing. Now is the time to get educated on how to strategically invest in commercial real estate for long-term financial freedom. Grab your copy of How to Passively Invest in a Changing Economic Environment. Go to www.mavericksinvest.com. Yeah. It's unique. And you're right. Your comments on lending, it has evolved and it appears to be ever evolving as this becomes really an asset class that's really a standalone asset class. Therefore, sooner or later, there needs to be a loan that is just specifically designed for this asset. Yeah, I agree with you. I mean, I see the full spectrum of what you can do. Like if you go to a conventional lender, mm -hmm. you can look at doing a vacation home loan. A lot of those lenders can still do 10% down. There's a lot of points on that product because yep. Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac tried to slow down the vacation home purchases during the pandemic exploded. Right. And then I have DSCR lenders. That's the debt service coverage ratio product. They're specifically looking at the property itself, how much it can make. They'll look at your FICO. They'll look at your real estate investing experience, um, but they're largely looking at the asset. And those loans have actually gone from... I used to get 15% down to like 25% down now. So if they are kind of, they keep changing based mm -hmm. on their portfolios, how much they're holding their own paper, what sort of decision they're going to make on rates, terms, and how much flexibility they're going to give you in the structure. So I have preferred lenders, lenders I've done deals with. I don't refer lenders I haven't done deals with. That's came back to bite me. Sure. So I send out well, at least three lenders to every buyer, depending what type of loan they're looking for, of people that own cabins that know how to get these loans done. Yeah. So. Yeah. So from a passive investor standpoint, somebody's looking at doing this, you know, you're at a spot today, fair to say that you don't have a portfolio. You don't have a fund. You're not raising capital from investors, but instead you educate investors who want to come in and really buy a property and either manage it directly or have you or somebody like you manage that. And that's really how you help guide somebody to be passive, to be hands-off and have exposure to this environment. What are the top two or three things that they absolutely need to get right when they're looking at doing a short-term rental in the Smokies? The numbers, they need to underwrite the deal. <laughs> it used to be you could put a blindfold on and pick a cabin mm. and it was going to make money. And that's yeah. just not the case anymore. We do have, I saw a statistic that there's 17,000 short-term rentals in the Smokies. Now you got to keep in mind the area is yeah. known for tourism. We are getting 12, 13, 14 million visitors a year. But when you talk about there being 17,000 options for travelers, you have to buy right. You have to get into the deal right. You have to buy the right deal in the right location, and you have to underwrite the numbers really strictly. You don't want to be over conservative because you can easily like talk yourself out of a deal. Sure. But you want to be realistic with how much it can make and what the expenses are going to be. It's very easy underwriting. I've taught it to children, believe it or not. It's not what I would do for a company like SpaceX, for sure. example. It's yeah. very easy and you just need to make sure you go through that exercise because if you are planning to be passive and get a property manager, the property manager is going to take X percent of gross rent. Mm -hmm. So you have to make sure you factor that into your numbers. I think one of the things, the big things I've seen coming out of the pandemic now is everybody got really excited. Airbnb had their huge marketing push during the pandemic and we saw investors just buying anything under the sun. Then they realized it's an awful lot of work to self-manage. And it's kind of annoying because people are asking you things you couldn't possibly know answers to if you don't live here or you're not in the cabin yourself. Like, where's the TV remote? Right. So when they realize how much work it is, and then they then want to pivot to go get a full service property manager, you can see where I'm going with this. Yes. They're in the red. Yep. So then they're forced to sell. And sometimes it's at a loss. So everybody that calls me that wants to sell, I do take listings. I do sell cabins. I try to coach them to figure out how they can keep it. 
Can they afford property management? What's the clever thing? Is there a project they could do to boost rent? What's the thing they could do besides feeling like a failure and selling the property? Yeah. So we are seeing a lot of that now. So just buy right, work with an uh, agent that's also an investor that knows the market that's doing it themselves. Don't get the agent that is just selling you the pretty house. That just, that's not a good plan. No, that's, that's, Yes. I won't pound on that, but I couldn't agree more with what you just said. Yeah. Somebody who's yeah. an investor first, probably an agent second. Yep. Yes. Totally agree yeah. with that. I'm like, my goal is not to be an agent for the rest of my life, but I was getting asked nonstop to help sure. people. And so I said, how can I make money on this? I'm right. smart. <laughs> yes. Yeah, exactly. Well, there was an absolute need and demand in the environment. You filled that with your expertise that you were educated on by being an investor first. Yes, exactly. Yeah. How or what are you most excited about this year? Oh my gosh, there's so much exciting stuff going on. I just wrapped up a remodel of, I did a test during largely during COVID, during the yeah. pandemic. I felt like the Smoky Mountain prices were just going up so fast. I just bought this house. It's not a cabin. I don't recommend doing it. It's done okay. It's making money. It's cash flowing, but just not what the cabins can do. So I took it offline and I did a massive remodel and I themed it out like crazy. And it is over the top, Dolly Parton, pink. And it is like going nuts right now. It's like we had a slow, our slowdown right when I finished in April and May. And I thought, oh no, I spent this money. It's not yeah. going to book. What am I going to end up selling it? What's going to happen? And then something clicked. And now it's just like, I'm doing a case study on it to see how high the ADR can go, right. which is our acronym for average daily rate. And so I have like very early numbers. So I won't quote anything yet because it's too soon, but I'm hopeful. And I have another one, so I'm going to do it again. I'm curious to see what the case study is when you come out with that. Some of these themed homes, when you go that direction, because nobody wants to live in a themed home. I mean, live, live in a themed right. home or how about almost nobody. But on vacation, you'll you'll do some things that are different, stay in different places, have a different experience, yeah. and it's cool and makes it for a cool story. People want to do things that are different and are cool and are fun and make cool stories and unique pictures. Yeah. Yeah. I've shared it on, I'm pretty active in the Bigger Pockets community, so I've yeah. shared it all over. You know, it's just starting to trend on their social and stuff. But even some of the men were like, uh... I would stay there, but like, I probably wouldn't do that to my property, but I would stay there. And yeah. I'm like, interesting. Okay. <laughs> That's cool. Yeah. Let's do this. I went on to the final segment, what I call the final four. Okay. What do you think holds most passive investors back from hitting their personal next level? Whatever that happens to be. Themselves. Mm. A thousand percent because you, your own worst critic. Yeah. You got to be careful with that self-talk. I'm guilty of this too. Like you say something out loud, like, oh, I have to do it that way. And it's like, do you really have to do it that way? Or do you want to do it that way? Mm -hmm. Like mindset is a real, a real big thing in investing because sometimes you're going to try something that's not the tried and true thing. You don't see a lot of people doing these dolly houses, right? For right. one example. So you need to like believe in yourself and you need to talk to yourself in that manner. If you think it's going to work out, it'll typically work out. But if you actually have the fear that it won't work out, it's probably not going to work out because you've got all that negative self-talk and it results in your actions as you're doing that. So a self-fulfilling prophecy, right? Yeah. What are you passionate about outside of real estate? Oh my goodness. It's mostly real estate and cabins. It really is. I am really passionate. I have a movement right now, uh, my impact mission. I'm really focused on empowering women. It still has to do with real estate though. I'll tell you, Neil. Yeah, it's, that's okay. <laughs> I know. I'm like, I'm working closely with some big names. Forbes is one of them. And then also Fox Business. But I have this impact mission that I came up with. And it's how I'm going to empower 1,000 women to become millionaires through real estate investing. So I just had an article published by Forbes where I did like an awful lot of months worth of research to figure out like, what's the statistic? Why are more women not getting into real estate investing? What's holding us back? And how do we lift each other up? And even like, what can men do to help us in the movement? And in the next, in June, I'm headed to MFINCON Multifamily Investor Nation, and I will be one of the speakers. And that's the topic I'm going to speak on. 
And I'm just hoping through this to just get the word out if women are feeling like they need help or they need to be lifted up. Again, back to the discussion of you're your own worst enemy. I think a lot of that is we see gender bias or we see imposter syndrome for ourselves. We feel like we're not worthy of doing something so big as to create generational wealth that we don't go down that road. We let up, we say, oh, that's for others. That's not for me. So I'm really just trying to get on a soapbox about it and preach it. And I'm doing a lot of things to give back in the real estate investing community to really support the movement. Great. Your favorite book? My favorite book? I'm going to say this one. Like right now, it is the rewrite of Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill, but it's for women. And it was written by Sharon Lecter, who I had the honor to meet recently. Smart, great woman. She was actually part of the Rich Dad, Poor Dad movement when Robert Kiyosaki was in his early years. She helped with the book and the game, Cash Flow. And this was one of the things, one of the projects that she was tapped to do. And it's pretty phenomenal. Your favorite way, I think maybe we touched on, but I'm going to give it to you anyway. Your favorite way to make an impact in the community. Yeah, definitely that. I mean, I think I can go a little further to say, like one of the things people ask you something really deep, like, what were you put on the earth for? Something like that. And you're like, holy crap, like, don't give me so much pressure right now. (laughs) But honestly, like my biggest thing is I want to do things and stretch myself in a way that lets other people go, wow, if she could do that. I'm just a normal, basic person doing normal, basic person things. But sometimes I stretch really far and do something crazy. It's all, all of that is just to see if I can do it, if I can succeed, and then to just empower others to do the same. That's great. Leslie, this has been a fun conversation. I know I've learned a lot more about the Smokies. I thought I knew some. You've stretched my knowledge base, but with a whole bunch of things and understanding the uniqueness of the short-term game. It's not just as easy as, you know, going on, searching Airbnb, seeing what competition is, and then just buying anything. You really have to understand that it is a completely different asset class than those that exist out there. And to find somebody to get educated one way or another, if you're going to be in this space. So for people, they want to find you, they want to follow you, they want to connect with you. What can they do? Where should they go? Yeah. My website is leslieannmorris.com and that's Ann with an E. On social media, Instagram is the best. I mean, if it's happening to the minute, I'm posting stuff on their case studies. I do have a book coming out about how to be passive in short-term rentals. It's my playbook, if you will. But the Instagram handle is at leslie.and.morris. Perfect. All the links will be below in the show notes for everybody. Leslie, this has been a great conversation. I appreciate your time and you being here. It's been fun. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you, Neil. You bet. Thanks so much. Have a good day. To our listeners, pat yourself on the back. You guys have made it to the end of the show and most people never finish what they start. If you receive value from today's show, be sure to share it on LinkedIn, your Facebook page, or your social media platform of choice. Subscribe to never miss a valuable episode in the future. And if you found value in today's episode, give us a thumbs up with a positive review. If there's a particular topic you'd like to hear about, well, I want to hear from you. Shoot me a message on LinkedIn. The link to my profile is below in the show notes. You can connect with me there for more valuable content.